Today on Voices for Change, celebrating Pride Month, the time for parades and protests. To be able to connect and amplify that joy between one another is what helps us really withstand a lot of this that's coming at us right now. Marking Juneteenth, the message from a local veterans group on Freedom Day. There is black excellence in this community and that we are open to collaborating and sharing our stories so that we can change the dynamic and focusing on acceptance and inclusivity, the Bay Area mom helping people with disabilities find belonging. Pushing past those feelings of discomfort and fear and just saying hi, asking questions to find similarities. Welcome to Voices for Change, I'm Greg Lee. We created this show to give a megaphone to the marginalized, to put a spotlight on those working for a more diverse and inclusive future. This month we mark Pride, a celebration of the LGBTQ community, their contributions, and a long fight for civil rights. Communities all over the Bay Area joined others around the country in raising the Progress Pride flag. The flag celebrates the diversity of the LGBTQ community. City leaders saying the important symbol represents support in the ongoing fight for equality and progress. We will continue to advocate for visibility, inclusion, representation, and belonging for LGBTQIA plus community members. Somewhere out there right now, there's a student who's gonna see that flag and realize that they have a safe place, that they are going through their own personal issues, but there is a community who loves them. This is the first time the Progress Pride flag was raised at the State Department of Education in Sacramento. State Superintendent Tony Thurman shared how California leaders are working to provide school and community resources for LGBTQ students. These celebrations happening on the backdrop of backlash against companies supporting the community and a flurry of anti-LGBTQ legislation around the country. According to the ACLU, there are 491 anti-LGBTQ bills making their way through state legislatures. They include education and health care related bills, bans on gender affirming care and restrictions on drag shows. In response, the human rights campaign issued a state of emergency for LGBTQ people accompanied by health and safety resources. There's many studies out there that have tied kind of the introduction of anti-LGBTQ legislation um, to an increase in negative health outcomes for people. Uh, they're more depressed, they experience more stress, uh, they often engage in other kinds of coping behaviors that are unhealthy um, related to this idea of their rights being stripped or even debated by state legislatures. With all this in mind, the SF LGBT Center's theme for Pride is unbreakable. They are standing in solidarity with some of the hardest hit communities nationwide. I spoke to director of programs Jennifer Valles about the importance of making time and space to celebrate and reminding everyone that Pride is as much about a parade as it is a protest. Jennifer, let me just start by saying happy Pride. And if you can, tell me what this month means to you and to the center. This month and this year in particular is just critical for us. You know, we are seeing massive waves of anti-trans, anti-LGBTQ plus legislation happening all across the country. And even here at home, you know, we are still continuing to see many challenges with housing our youth, getting stable employment for our communities, and really just rebuilding that sense of community after COVID. This year, we are just beyond excited to step into Pride the way that Pride was meant to be leverage. Pride is a riot. Pride is a protest. Pride is about standing up for our rights for each other, uh, our brethren here at home and all across the world. And that's really what we're doing this year. How important is it for your members uh, to work hand in hand with other communities that may be more affected than San Francisco? You know, in San Francisco, we have so many people that relocate here. And so many members of our community, including some of our staff, are originally from some of these states, North Carolina, Florida, Texas, where we're seeing these waves of anti-LGBTQ plus legislation. So it is hitting home really hard for a lot of folks here in the Bay Area. And as we're seeing these things tick up, we're also seeing an influx of folks moving here, knowing that they can be affirmed and supported supported and live as their authentic selves. But that means that we are facing a lot more challenges as well. The theme uh, for the Center for Pride is unbreakable. And I know that is not by mistake. Can you speak to what unbreakable means to you? 
I'm going to speak for what it means for us here at the center right now. We have a small committee of folks that are part of our pride committee and out of that group, it really just came to light that we needed to reach out to our sibling centers in these states. We needed to do what we could, even from all the way over here, to support our entire community. And for as much as, yes, we do face significant challenges here in California, especially here at the center, we do have a voice. We, and we are able to amplify the voices of those that are not being heard right now. And so when we reached out to these sibling centers, they were beyond grateful just to have someone say, hey, we care, is there anything we can do? And I know from our end, even in the work we do, we rely so heavily on our partners, even if they can't step in exactly the way that we would need, whatever that looks like, just having someone in your corner, someone reaching out and saying, we're here, we care, we want to support you, just lifts an enormous psychic weight and really helps to build a sense of community and joy. This is as much protest as it is parade. Uh, but how important is it for the community to make space to celebrate, to make space to recognize the accomplishments and the contributions of the LGBTQ community while still understanding there are challenges on the horizon? It is, Greg, it is always a both and. We have to maintain that celebration. We have to continue to reflect ourselves back to each other as we're being told from so many different places that we aren't worthy or we aren't in the world in the right way that we should be. To see ourselves reflected by humans that we know are just incredible and contributing so much to this world and to be able to connect and amplify that joy between one another is what helps us really withstand a lot of this that's coming at us right now we know who we are we know we've been here we know we'll continue to be here and we know we will continue to be arm in arm both with our local community and our far-flung uh, community members in other states and around the world. So join us in joy, join us in celebrating, and yes, join us in the work. A nonprofit program in San Francisco is creating a space for young LGBTQ artists, not just to foster creativity, but to ensure they're caring for their mental health. Equity connects queer artists to individual and group therapy. I spoke to Executive Director Ryan McCarrigan. Ryan, thanks so much for taking the time. This program was built out of the pandemic when so many artists lost work. So tell me about making the link between queer artists and mental health. Sure, so it's a great question. Um, well, first of all, at Queer Life Space, our core mission is to provide affordable access to mental health and substance abuse services. And we take a very intersectional lens in terms of our clientele and how we meet them where they are. And the desire to focus on emerging artists, young artists uh, who don't necessarily have insurance or, or the resources that other groups have was motivated out of the fact that they were one of the hardest hit segments during the pandemic. A lot of artists work in the gig economy. Many of them uh, you know, were already struggling financially. And so we felt that this was something that we wanted to highlight and design a new program around. And also it's worth calling out the fact that Many of us on staff love the arts. I'm also an artist myself. And so, you know, we felt that this was something that aligned with our personal values in addition to the mission of Queer Life Space. Uh, Ryan, can you talk about the success you saw out of just the first pilot year of this program to see the fruits of this labor? So uh, we had a small cohort, uh, about eight participants who were between the ages of about 18 to 21 um, all of them were visual artists. Uh, they, they came to us as part of a call for artists that we put out last spring uh, to exhibit at our annual gala, which happened, I think it was May, May 7th, uh, 2022. That was our 10 year anniversary gala. We had this wonderful exhibition as part of the gala and all of the artists who were represented in that exhibition were part of the equity program. Um, after doing the exhibition, they took part in some workshops and trainings designed to help them have better business savvy, how to kind of design their personal brand online, design a LinkedIn, how to manage legal documents, which is something that you don't always learn, even if you've gone to art school, even, even uh, many prestigious art schools don't really get into the nuts and bolts of how to create a business, how to manage transactions, how to design 
all of the legal documentation that you need to be above board as a as a artist who sells their works and is building a real business. So many anti-LGBTQ bills are being considered around the country. Why is mental health more important than ever, especially with the groups that you were working with? We feel that our responsibility as a mental health agency is to sort of, you know, recognize this environment that our clients come to us in and, and what they're experiencing. That's just another layer on top of the existing issues that they dealt with, whether they were from childhood or in adulthood. This is just yet another pressure, external pressure that contributes to new or existing feelings of depression, anxiety, or, or any other comor comorbid issues that they deal with. So we feel that we have a huge responsibility to recognize that is the environment that we're in today. It is a big, big topic of discussion, as you would expect when, when our clinicians are with our clients. And so we do our best to create space for them to talk about this. And of course, we also feel it, right? It's not just the clients, it's also uh, the staff and clinicians at Queer Life Space who are also inhabiting this hostile environment. A time for us to get the things out that you want to express, connect with different people, explain to them some of the things and the struggles that you've gone to. Coming up, celebrating Juneteenth, the organization that marked Freedom Day by helping black veterans. Plus. Nothing should stop us from trying to help each other. You know, we see a need and, you know, as long as you have the, the resources, do your research. Filling the void, two sisters in the North Bay saw something their community was lacking and stepped up to create a brand. Coming up, their message of inclusion. Don't you, to me, means freedom. It means um, freedom of speech. It means liberty. It means honoring our ancestors. A special new tradition in San Francisco. The inaugural Juneteenth Parade kicked off a month of events. Juneteenth is the day in 1865 when enslaved black Americans in Texas finally learned they were free two years after President Lincoln had signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Juneteenth, now a national holiday. In honor of Juneteenth, the One Vet, One Voice organization honored black veterans. The focus of their programming this month using art as a healer and recognizing black excellence. CEO Courtney Ellington tells me it's all about connecting these vets to the community. For you and the organization and other black veterans, what does Juneteenth mean? Okay, so I work with a lot of veterans of different walks, walks of life and backgrounds. But for the black veterans specifically, after not being heard for so many years and not being heard on the local and the national level, this is a time to where they feel heard, they feel supportive. So Juneteenth means a time for us to get the things out that you want to express, connect with different people, explain to them some of the things and the struggles that you've gone to, because now this is the time when people are actually listening. So uh, for the Black veterans, this, this was an opportunity for them to get out to let people know, hey, we are here. We want to feel like we are a part of the community as well. PTSD and the anxiety. Uh, can you speak to how art is helping these vets heal? Yes. Okay. So uh, our slogan is connecting the community to, uh, to veterans. So we do it through art and entertainment. And one way of doing that is we meet up at the War Memorial Veterans Building at least once or sometimes twice a month. And we showcase our skills, whether it's drawing, whether it's uh, through fashion, whether it's through art and entertainment as far as, as, as music. But what we do is we also invite the community to come in. And whether you're going through something, when you get around people who are involved in art, it change how you feel, it change your mood. So it is a healer. A lot of people that I've talked to, they express themselves with stories through, through the art. They write things down, they draw them, and they like to talk about their stories and express what made you come up with this particular art piece. So um, we focus on people telling us how art healed them, how art got you through some of those toughest times. Veterans are more than just 
PTSD or homeless. We have veterans out there with some real talent and being able to bring the community with the veterans to sh so the community can show this is what I'm doing and the veterans show what well, this is what I'm doing. It brings those conversations up and it heals us at the same time. Corey, I love the panel that you, you just had uh, uh, talking about black excellence and overcoming adversity. How important is it to continue having these important discussions? It is very important because, uh, you know, one of the things that I notice is that people avoid those uncomfortable conversations. And how could we solve problems and how could we come to solutions if we don't sit at the table and have these uncomfortable conversations? And also, I like to change the dynamic that people have when it comes to Blacks and Black veterans alone. This panel was very important to show that there is Black excellence in this community and that we are open to collaborating and sharing our stories so that we can change the dynamic and make a difference and be better and build better communities. Now to a story about stepping up to fill a void in a community. Sisters Eva Karikari and Ernestina Apronku said they couldn't find the textured hair products they needed in Sonoma County, so they opened their own store. They say the response has affirmed their decision to pursue their goals. I just wanna start with, with maybe you, Eva. Tell me what drove you to open the beauty supply bar. Well, as an African-American woman, um, you know, living in Sonoma County for many, many years, I realized that it was becoming more difficult to find just basic beauty supply, you know, products, um, even, you know, hair extensions. And um, it just became more challenging and we will have to drive literally to either Vallejo or Oakland to find quality hair care supplies. And, you know, over the years, you know, I was driving there with my family. I have three daughters and um, needing to you know, waste resources and, and energy and time. Um, it just became more um, frustrating for me. And so, you know, me and Tina at some point put our heads together and figure out what are the barriers that will stop us in, in opening up a shop here in Sonoma County. And we couldn't come up with any barriers and we just had a plan and we went through the process and we opened our own shop. Ernestina, describe that moment of looking at each other and saying, we're gonna do this, we're gonna make it our own. At first, I wasn't really, really sure if we were gonna do this, but when we started putting things together, then yes, I realized we can do this. That's really beautiful. Ernestina, for you, Describe what the response has been from the customers in Sonoma County. I'm sure all over the North Bay that come to you now. Oh yeah, it's been so great. Like most of the customers just thank me or thank Eva for opening the shop because they, they were tired of like traveling to Vallejo or Clan. And now they can just five minutes, 10 minutes away. They can come to the store and get what they want. Eva, obviously that has to feel good to create a space for people. Uh, but the overarching cultural message here about seeing a void in the community and working to fill it. I mean, what is the message? The message is, you know, nothing should stop us from trying to help each other. You know, we see a need and, you know, as long as you have the, the resources, do your research and, um, and, and think about how you can fill that void that the community is lacking. And so we really thought about it hard to make sure that we, we could meet the community needs and, and therefore how can we continue to disseminate our information to folks out in the community to come to our shop and, and take the burden, so to speak, off their plate and having to sit in the car for 40, 50 minutes to drive. And, and like Tina said, they walk in the store and literally just the relief on their face, you know, they're thanking us. And that truly makes us feel really good knowing that they appreciate our effort and in turn, they are here to support our business. Uh, this question is for, for both of you, Ernestina, I'll start with you. What is the message to others who may find themselves in your shoes or even the message to your kids uh, about believing in yourselves and what you can do? To me, there's nothing you cannot do. Once you set your mind towards what you wanna do, just work towards it and it's, it's gonna be possible. Yeah, Eva? I would agree to that. You know, there are always obstacles that will come in anybody's way. 
And so as long as you have a strategy and, you know, do your research to make sure that what you're trying to accomplish would be, you know, feasible, then just take measures into your hands and just tackle each barrier at a time and then get to your, your end goal. We say, don't stare, show you care. And it's as simple as just smiling and saying hi. Still to come, the Bay Area mom working to build a more inclusive society for people with disabilities. A look at her work after the break. A Bay Area mom is working to change how society treats and sees people with disabilities. Larkin O'Leary's son was born with Down syndrome and a number of medical issues. With him in mind, she's made it her mission to support, educate, and work towards a more inclusive society. You started Common Ground Society because of your son, James, who yeah. is nine now. How yeah. has he continued to inspire you? Oh, man. The, watching this child navigate life um, daily helps me to be a, a better human being just solely based on watching his joy on those simple things. Things that I take for granted, uh, James has to work extra hard for. And when he's able to do those things, um, the joy that it brings him and all of us. The goal of CGS is to create a more inclusive community. Can you describe how that mission has continued to grow, especially for people with disabilities? Our mission is like we've been shot out of a cannon here in Sonoma County. Our families and, and, and the expanding counties, right? Marin, Napa, we've even gone down to San Diego to help spread the word. And watching our community eat up the information that we learn from disabled adults and we're able to disseminate among our, our community has been incredible. All of our families who come to our various meetups um, help guide our mission and message that we spread to the world. Uh, watching my son in his own school and watching his friends come up to him and learn sign language so they know how to talk to him, it inspires us to keep going every day. I mean, my mantra is you don't know what you don't know until you know. And this is why I shout the worth and spread the, the word of accessibility, uh, because I myself did not understand how things uh, could so easily be tweaked to make it accessible for someone. And when we know better, we do better, right? For example, the Epic Center and the Children's Museum have both added um, adult-sized changing tables to their, um, to their restrooms so that people who have to be changed that are larger and don't fit on those the little baby things don't have to be placed on the, 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 the ground. Things that you and I likely never thought of, right, until we understood that that was a need. And so simple things like bringing, having headphones um, in places that are loud, that are available for, for your people or having fidgets, um, those types of things can be really simple. Adding uh, captions to different videos, those types of things can be really simple modifications that can make a huge difference. And if we're able to do those, why not? Larkin, you talked about your mottos. One of the other mottos on the website is it starts with hello and ends with belonging. How simple can yeah. being inclusive be? Yeah. I mean, truly, growing up as a kid, I was always taught don't stare, don't stare, right? But the one thing that we never talked about is what do you do after that, right? So we say don't stare, show you care. And it's as simple as just smiling and saying hi pushing past those feelings of discomfort and fear and just saying hi. We also offer presentations to K-12 schools uh, designed by me. We have curriculum, um, including my new book, uh, Want to Play, which features local Sonoma County kids who have disabilities and how to interact with them. It has the tagline in it. When you're curious, just say hi and follow their lead. We also do presentations to college uh, future teachers and the community about how to be inclusive. We've done everything from Kaiser Grand Rounds, California SELPA, to even an orthodontist office here in Sonoma County. So uh, we really tailor our presentations to help people see just the little tweaks that they can make to make it accessible for families like mine. That's our show for today. I always appreciate you watching. We'll see you next month. Be good to each other.